Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Tony the Mole Adams YouTube channel. Uh, this week, Tony's uh, where he was last week. He's uh, he's in he's in the northern beaches of Sydney, and I've moved from Belgrade to Nîmes in the south of France, joining sort of a bit of a family holiday. But off to see Sam Tompkins come back um, on Saturday for Catalans against uh, Hull FC. Tony, how are you? Yeah, doing well, Steve. And just on Sam Tompkins, um, he got a bad rap uh, when he was over here with the, with the Warriors. I actually thought he was better than uh, a lot of the criticism that came his way. Well, what's your opinion of that? Yeah, he's one of the best play English players in Super League history, and I think maybe uh, he he's he he was very elusive before he went to the Warriors, uh, and um, probably his role there was more. They say if you're on the field with him, he's a very good coordinator of defence, uh, and that you know he. I mean. He did get voted as one of the worst imports in, in the NRL history, which was extremely exactly. harsh and extremely unfair and I think, I think wrong. But he's certainly one of the best English players in Super League history. Uh, but, you know, he retired because of his knee problem. Uh, and uh, he, he's been training in, in sort of private. Uh, but, you know, he did a movie called The Last Chance. You don't have to change the name of that movie to The Second Last Chance now. So uh, it was a good film too. So I don't know how happy his uh, filmmaker would be about, it, about his comeback, but uh be very interested to see how he goes and, and whether he goes beyond this year. Um, before we go to your first item, Tony, um, just to, uh, I want to offer my condolences. We've already, we lost David Morrow, a great broadcaster who I worked with a lot in the last fortnight and his funeral was only in the last 24 hours as we record uh, this. And um, he was a great guy, Thirsty, and I probably... Um, have held off saying much because I wanted to not just say the same things as everybody else. But um, Thirsty loved life and he was an all-rounder, as I'm sure you'll agree, Tony. And it was more rugby league welcomed him and gave him opportunities because he, he could have called anything. He could have called Olympic sports, swimming, rugby union, soccer, anything. He could have called anything. And it's, it's rugby league that gave him a uh, home, I think, and, and he deserves his place in the Hall of Fame. And Bill Arthur, who we knew as a sideline eye on Sky, but who actually called maybe the greatest game I've ever seen, I don't say that lightly, was at uh, the COVID um, grand final in Super League uh, with a try scored in the final second with a deflection off the upright. Um, he By then, he descended to being the main caller of the great, of may, definitely the greatest Super League game ever played and maybe the best game I've ever seen. Um, and, and he also deserves a place in, in history. Bill, anyway, he was... Uh, the loveliest guy. He wouldn't wouldn't have a malicious bone in his body. Wouldn't know or care about any of the Machiavellian goings on in rugby league. So um, rest easy, both Thirsty and uh, Bill. Um, Tony. Yeah, it's been, it's been a sad uh, couple of days for rugby league. And as we were talking about uh, before we uh, went on air, Steve, uh, it's been a sad couple of years. We, we've lost a lot of a lot of great people in rugby league and. Uh, some not so nice people seem to live forever. It's very strange. <laughs> Let's move on, Tony. Uh, to your first item. Now we're here to promote Tony's uh, column, which you can read every week at nine.com.au. Don't forget to like and subscribe to this channel. Um, and the first item, Robbie Farrer is departing. He, I think he's got a lesser role for the rest of the year. And then he's departing West Tigers at the conclusion of the season. And, and your first item, Tony, is about that. Yeah, and it's actually been brewing for a couple of months, Steve. I, I heard quite a while ago that uh, uh, he was going to leave at the end of the year. Uh, I, I couldn't firm it up. It, it, I couldn't get it official. But uh, one of the main reasons is that uh, he's had, shall we say, uh, a long-running difference of opinion with uh, Appy Coruscant. Uh You might remember last season, there was a bit of a blow-up on the touchline uh, when he was running the blue shirt training uh job and uh that was sort of i think the the beginning of the end and uh yeah it's it's interesting they've 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 sort of uh whitewashed it as you tend to do with uh the departure of uh people who are out of favor but um yeah it 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 comes down to uh the the captain and the assistant coach not getting on um and Benji's had to make the tough, tough call, and he probably made the only call he, he could make. And I think now he realises he needs a, a more experienced uh, assistant coach. Uh, both him and Robbie were new to coaching, and uh, it's been a bit of a struggle. So it uh, be interesting to see who, who he exactly comes up with. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised, Tony, if they bring in a you know, complete you know, outsider. Um, you know, with uh, Shane, Shane Richardson 
being new to the club and, and all the staff being in place when he got there, I imagine he would want to sort of make his mark as well and, and maybe bring in someone who, uh, who, who you know, who, who sees things for, from a different uh, angle. Uh, I do have the glasses back on, you're right, and the light went out because I, I just wanted to double-check Tanner Boyd is the next item we're talking about. And uh, you say he's, 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 um, he's going to be in demand at other clubs, Tony. That's the, uh, the young half from the Titans. Yeah, well, look, Steve, he's only played uh, eight games as a starting halfback this season, and we're up to what about round 20. Uh, he's either been on the bench or playing uh, Queensland Cup, and there are a lot of clubs after a halfback. He's he's not the best halfback in the NRL, but he's he's certainly not the worst, and uh, uh, I think Des Hasler's decided that the future's elsewhere. So uh, he's off contract at the end of next year, but it wouldn't surprise me if he moves on uh, over the summer if a deal's done. Uh, I'm not sure where he's going, but uh, you look through the NRL and you, you'll see the clubs, they, they, they're sort of glaring the obvious which clubs uh, need a halfback. So they'll be the ones who'll probably look at him. Now, good blokes. We've been talking about good blokes before. And uh, PJ Marshall was always a good fella. I always enjoyed my dealings with him when he was uh, at the Warriors and played for Queensland. And his son is about to arrive on the scene in the NRL. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And doesn't stories like this make you feel old, Steve? Uh, uh, his his name's uh, Braylon, uh, and he's in his final year of uh, high school at St Brendan's at Yapoon, which is a well-known uh, Queensland rugby league nursery. And he signed with the Dolphins. Uh, he's seventeen years old. He's a, he's a hooker, just like his dad was. And uh, he's going to start out in the Malmeninga Cup next year. And I actually spoke to PJ because, as you say, he's uh, he's all, 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 always a, a good fellow, always willing to talk to the media. And he's absolutely chuffed, as you would imagine. And uh, had a fine career himself, PJ, with the Eels, Warriors, Broncos, and also played four games for the Maroons. So it be very interesting to see how his boy goes. And finally, you, it's now a challenge to you, I think, Tony, to mention a new name every week that no one else has heard of. And uh, this week you've thrown up a guy called Larry Leha. Tell us about Larry. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Larry's a, a, a rangy back rower uh, from De La Salle College in Auckland. Uh, he's 17, same uh, age as uh, PJ's boy. And uh, he's joining the Tigers uh, next season. Uh, so he's, he's won... The Warriors can't keep. I guess they they can't keep them all. The Warriors have got so many good players in New Zealand and Aussie clubs uh, come raiding regularly. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So uh, we'll just have to see. But the, the the Tigers say this this kid's got the goods. So uh, we'll watch how he goes with a full off season under his belt and see how he uh, starts off next season. The uh, WNRL got underway just before we recorded this. Tony, did you did you have a squiz at that? Yeah, I did, and uh, it it ended very similarly to a, an NRL game uh, involving the Warriors last weekend, where a, a simple uh, kick uh, in the NRL it was Chanel to Vita Harris uh, should have uh, tied the scores uh, uh, after a late try, and the same thing happened. The Roosters scored late. Uh, Jess Sergis uh, went over for a try. Uh, easy conversion, but uh, I'm not going to embarrass the kicker, uh, partly because I can't remember her name, but she missed the <laughs> kick and the uh, the Knights squeaked home by two points, but a uh, good game of footy. What's the other reason you're not embarrassing? <laughs> <laughs> um, and also the World Cup, I guess, and no surprises there to most people who have any knowledge of what's going on. That it was uh, It's 10, t- 10 teams in the men and it's, it's in Australia and New Guinea, but some people just seem like uh, um, to they, they seem to be passionate about it, but they don't take the time to um, find out anything about it when it comes to the International Rugby League. Someone said, why don't they have qualifiers? I mean, have been having qualifiers for the last four World Cups. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like people people just want to be angry. But, I, you know, like I kind of think that, yeah, it's, it's sad that it's only 10 teams. And, yeah, a serious World Cup of a serious international sport has more than 10 teams. But, you know, we're not really a serious international sport yet. And uh, the idea is that it's probably better to uh, make a big profit and give it to Greece or give it to Jamaica or give it to America in the, in terms of uh, coaching and referee education rather than putting up, and this wouldn't be the case in all cases, And but rather than putting up people whose grandparents came from that country for a month in a hotel 
and then and then having them uh, get heavily beaten. Uh, it's a different approach. But the last World Cup didn't make enough money to support the, the game internationally, so they've got to try something different. So people expect me, for one, to be jumping up and down. Oh, why has it gone back to ten teams? But I'm actually okay with it. I'm okay with it. I I can kind of see the the rationale behind it. What do you What do you think, Tony? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the the, the worst thing when you have a World Cup in any sport is a team beating a hundred nil. And if we, uh, you know, if we went to twenty teams, I think that would uh, happen uh, without naming teams. Um, and uh, what while you're on uh, the international flavour, we keep hearing over here that. Uh, uh, the Las Vegas uh, experiment, which, of course, we in the NRL tried this year and uh, now Super League are going to try next year. We're, we're hearing it's absolutely going gangbusters in England. Can you confirm this as far yeah, as... Yeah, the, uh, uh, the Wigan Supporters Bay. The Wigan Supporters Bay and the um, Hull and the Warrington Supporters Bay went on sale uh, yesterday and Wigan is down to single seats already and they're spilling over into the, wow. near, the Penrith uh, Bay, I think, already. Uh, the English make an art, have made an art form of travelling for sport. Um, <laughs> as we know, sometimes when we turn on the news and see their soccer fans here on the mainland in Europe, uh, but, but the rugby league fans are much uh, better behaved and certainly these two clubs have very well behaved fans. And it's not a novelty to the English. You know what I mean? Like it is to the Australians who are like, you know, uh, obsess about it. Where am I going to stay? What am I going to have for dinner in six months' time? You know what I mean? Uh, the English uh, travel for sport habitually and uh, the and, and it has gone absolutely uh, nuts. Um, and uh, I'd like to think that maybe that would encourage the NRL to get... The NRL can finally see the value in the British game, numbers, heads, fans, people who spend money, uh, and they, they can see... I mean, someone said to me, it's like, uh, it's like they're only... Um, one of someone on Twitter said that they're only on in in on this in Vegas, Tony, because it's like they play the same sport. It's like you two will have an unknown band on, on the um on the bill who because just because they're on the same record label or on the same management company. Well, this is actually a case of like uh the um the support band has as many fans as the headliner. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. it's like the Grateful Dead supporting um the Grateful Dead supporting U2. Most people don't think the Grateful Dead are as good as U2, but the Grateful Dead inexplicably have a lot of fans who spend a lot of money and will travel anywhere. And let's face it, if the NRL are U2, they couldn't sell out that stadium last year. They've asked help from the support band. So uh, I, I think people who went this year were surprised how many Brits were there. There was absolutely no connection um, uh, to the British game. In fact, I know Salford ran a supporters tour up against a home game. They actually were willing to encourage people to leave town when they were playing at home. I don't think they got enough numbers. I don't think it went, but that's how big this is in England. And uh, Wigan and Warrington fans are beside themselves with excitement. And as I said, it's already made a fortune in the first 24 hours. Yeah. Well, you and I were there last year, Steve, and oh, this year, I should say, and it, it was amazing. And, and bringing this whole new aspect of the, the British teams and the British fans uh, should should be sensational. And, and I know the British fans from my my trips over there. They won't just want to watch uh, Wigan and Warrington. They'll they'll stay and hang around for the Panthers, for the Warriors. Uh, you know they'll they'll want to see the the cream of the NRL. So it's uh, it's win win. And they'll crowd into those. Uh, like the the Fremont Street uh, fan night was is already packed. They'll have to actually lock people out of that next year. <laughs> and I love to go to the things like the Matty John show. I had one Wigan fan on today on on Twitter. Um, he, he thought that uh, actually they were going to get kicked out after uh, Wigan and Warrington had to buy another ticket. Uh, so I had, to explain, <laughs> I had to explain, no, no, you can stay in there. But I don't think any stadium in the world has got enough staff to go around and kick people out after one game. Uh, although Huddersfield, which where they invented rugby league, uh, they also this year invented uh, kicking people out after the curtain raiser. They said, we've got a women's game, but it's not included in your ticket. So you've got to leave after the women's game and line back up to get in for the men's. Someone said, I'll just hide in the toilet. <laughs> anyway, anyway, Tony, it's been a pleasure. Next week, yes, I'll, be as always. In, I'll be back in uh, in London. And uh, I really want to thank everyone for supporting the channel. Uh, we're getting bigger and better. It's been a slow burn, but we've had some uh, really big episodes. We've had some other episodes that, you know, we thought they were important things to talk about. Maybe the algorithm didn't uh, pick them up, uh, but we're not here just to get people to watch. We're here to... 
uh, talk about Tony's column. Whatever's in Tony's column, we talk about. So uh, we'll see you all next week. And uh, thanks for your time again, Tony. My pleasure, Steve. And uh, safe trip.